Do I have to? Yes. Obviously, this, um, this is putting me in a bit of an awkward situation here, but, uh, yeah. Oh, just, dude. It's all, right. all right, all right. Fine. <sighs> On behalf of everybody here at Six Like Productions, I would like to formally apologize for the things I said about Red vs. Blue Season 9. I'm sorry. Okay? But at the time I made the video, I had no idea how much worse things were gonna get. The simulated Blood Gulch bits were annoying, but you know, at least I can appreciate the callback to the original Blood Gulch stuff. They were doing something a little different. They were trying to do a balance of old school Blood Gulch and New Age Freelancer CGI and balance the two stories. They needed to fill a story of Church in the memory unit while also showing us what happened to Tex and the Freelancers. Granted, it didn't completely work, but I understand. Seasons 11 and 12 on first glance are passable seasons, but on subsequent rewatches, you start to really realize the problems that plague the Chorus trilogy. You see the attempts to mimic the humor of Blood Gulch without really understanding what made Blood Gulch so good in the first place. The attempts to go into the gray area of war that gets dropped almost immediately in favor of a tired as hell save the world from evil mercenaries plot. You see how the writers give you no information, and yet at the same time, too much information. There is a lot of exposition, but none of it really means anything, you know? But on first glance, it seems like a step in the right direction. A more serious storyline to further evolve these characters and look into some cool concepts, so not all that bad. So, yeah, I apologize to all the fans of RB9. Obviously, there is some bad blood between me and this season. I did not like it when it first aired. I still don't really like it all that much now, but... To say it is the worst season of the series is no longer anywhere remotely accurate. And I'm sure once I get to the Joe Nicolosi years, I'm going to end up apologizing again because humanity is fallible, opinions change based off new information presented, and nothing we do in this world is ever permanent. Which leads me at long last to Red vs. Blue Season 13. And, and no, I'm sorry, I have no idea whatsoever why it's taken me so long to get to this fucking piece of shit. <laughs> Okay, I took a lot of flack for 12. Like, a lot of flack. Which I understand, because 12 is, you know, a, the, probably the best of the trilogy. And, and you know, it, it holds up a little bit well on, a, on rewatches. And, uh, you know, some of the statements I made in 12, I would, I would probably take back today. Like that whole comparing Doyle to Tarkin line. That was, I, I don't know where my head was on that one. That was a stupid thing to say. But, uh, this one, oh boy, <laughs> 13, aptly named 13, uh, I don't expect to make it out of this season alive. I expect the angry mobs to come and get me when it's over, drag me out in the streets, and draw and quarter me. And I accept it now, because unlike 11 and 12, where, you know, upon subsequent rewatches I found more and more problems, 13 I knew right out of the gate I was in trouble. And I wish I could say that over time those feelings have died down, but uh, seeing as we're here right now, obviously that isn't the case because I tell you this now without any lie, without any, any messing around or exaggerating or anything like that, with a completely straight face, this is the worst season of Red vs. Blue. The absolute worst. Because... Unlike with RVB9, it wasn't just trying to recreate Blood Gulch for the umpteenth time. It wasn't just, you know, sitting around doing nothing or, or anything like that. Here, it was just bad writing, a, a complete betrayal of, of pre-established continuity in the series, and just the absolute destruction of any storyline they were going for in RVB in the Red vs. Blue Chorus trilogy. The season opens all right. It's a bit of a callback to the opening of RVB 10. We get introduced to the crew of a prisoner ship that is transporting, well, prisoners, but suddenly there is an alert of an approaching spacecraft and we get treated to a shameless Star Wars ripoff. The first issue I have with this season clocks in right about now. <laughs> <laughs> this guy's my fucking hero! <sighs> okay, okay, I'm just joking. The real issue I take happens after the facade breaks. Huh? No survivors. Why didn't they just do that from the start? 
They all have cloaking units. There is no reason why they can't just storm the ship and kill the crew a la Hollow Man. Like, Felix's entire diversion is fucking pointless. The ship's crew didn't tell him anything that he most likely didn't already know, and the audience isn't really learning anything either, because we can already establish this as a prisoner ship by the cells we saw earlier. You don't set up an assault of this kind on a ship of this size without knowing beforehand what it is you're hijacking. And even if Felix and Locus were dumb enough to assault without any prior knowledge, shocking I know, but bear with me here, they could easily just hack the ship's computers to figure it out, and don't even tell me that in the year 25 whatever the year this is that no one in their platoon knows how to hack a computer. Also, that's a really cruel thing to have hatches launching them into space in their cells. Is it to prevent prisoner riot? Because unless it was for an assault on Precinct 13 situation, that seems a little extreme to be a built-in design for a carrier ship. I mean, fuck, what if one of the guards hits the button on accident? Wouldn't that be a hell of a thing to have to explain to the commander? We've got a prisoner who doesn't really look up to par. Smartass put two and two together and tied his bed sheets around his waist before the purge. He has to speak with you. Says he has something you need. Oh great, even when in space you can't keep Jehovah from staying on board to preach the good news. Ah, shit. Yep, it's the counselor. And about time, too. If we're going in chronological order, this is his first appearance since the EMP went off in Reconstruction. That was, what, seven years ago at this point? Dude's been a virtual recluse. Did you know Agent Washington refuses artificial intelligence access to his neural implants? A fact that literally does not matter in the slightest. Or that Agent Carolina is 57% more likely to neglect her teammates when presented with a competitive scenario. That's a really specific number to give for someone who runs off on her own. So they decided to bring the counselor on board for his knowledge as well as this guy that we've never seen before. <laughs> What is this, an episode of Days of Our Lives where everybody comes back for revenge? Next you're gonna tell me Robot Arm Guy is back. I mean, why not, right? Dude survived 10 billion gigawatts of pure kinetic energy being dropped on his head. In fact, wait a minute, he survived the orbital bombardment too! Did that fucking laser kill anyone? Did it do anything aside from destroy a piece of government property? I'm sorry, Dr. Church, but I'm really having trouble believing in your capabilities of managing a war when you have a giant mech cannon capable of putting half a continent of people out of a home in order to finance it, and you are exactly zero for two on killing semi-relevant characters. So we meet up with the Reds and Blues again and get an idea of what's been going on in the unknown period of time that the time skip was, and see what the merging of the two armies, of course, have led to. We see Wash training the troops, Simmons and Lopez doing equipment maintenance, Kimball and Doyle being petty... So overall, things are doing pretty okay. Doubly so when we see that Carolina, Sarge, and Tucker have been kicking mercenary ass in the meantime. But with the reacquiring of stolen freelancer technology, including a domed energy shield, Church and Carolina are focused on the alien structures that seem to be dotted all over the planet like the wonders of the world. Something that the rest, of course, seems to take entirely for granted. It's a giant flying tower! And you're a dead guy that's also somehow an AI, okay? It is 400 feet tall and it fucking shoots plasma in the sky! Come on, let's have a little shock and awe here, people. Oh, right, I forgot about this Haunty Zoe bitch. Fuck her, too. Now, most of the stuff involving Red Team in this first half is pretty dull. Which is par for the course, I reckon. I mean, seriously, I've got, like, an entire playlist of videos cataloging how nothing ever happens with Red Team. It's kind of been there, done that at this point. I don't even have any funny jokes to make about it anymore. They hang around Harmonia and manage the weapons cache and motor pool, and then eventually they'll get dragged along to go fight. Although I guess Red Team also is used to show off how tension in the capital between the two previously warring factions is still high. It's odd to me that Rooster Teeth made more effort to show the tension between the two armies than they did showing the fondest discrimination in Ruby. I mean, it's still not great, but at least there's an effort there. Anyway, so the mini group heads out to the giant temple to explore, wherein we learn that Caboose keeps confetti in his freckles gun. I mean, okay, granted, I wouldn't trust a loaded gun in Caboose either, but this just raises all kinds of questions as to how that gun still fires and what the cleaning maintenance is on it. Tucker's key activates the tower, and in doing so causes all the alien technology to go haywire and shut down completely, including the stuff held by the mercs. We also see a weird alien AI thing, and, well, so yeah, if you haven't been getting the little hints they've been dropping in seasons 11 and 12, one aspect of the Chorus trilogy was addressing the alien subplot that was set up way back in Season 3 with Tucker's sword. Which, I gotta give the season credit, that was the one storyline from the original Decades run that was kinda left open without a real explanation. The Great Prophecy was always this weird, vague thing that seemed to go in five different directions at once, and here now we are given some appropriate clarity of it. Kind of. You've reproduced. Fuck yeah, Junior is awesome. 
Check him out in this fifth grade basketball team. I do like whenever they mention Junior, just to like show they haven't forgotten about him. And, you know, Tucker getting to show off his kid, you know, it just warms the cockles of my heart. So the crew is arguing about how best to proceed with this new development. Kimball is all about taking direct action by diving headfirst into assaults on Crash Site Alpha, which is a terrible plan and will only get them all killed. Doyle proposes divide and conquer. You know, like a military general would do. And Carolina agrees to take the team to the temple to see what they can find, while the rest of the army with Red Team and Wash and Toe will assault the crash site. And while that's going on, Felix and Locus are dealing with the unfortunate circumstances of their lot in life. I can't stand this prick. He's our employer. Still a prick. Hello, Pot. Have you met Kettle? So we see that the chairman has been collecting a lot of trophies from the freelancer adventures, basically all of the leftover pieces. There's Tech's destroyed helmet from the end of Revelation, the memory in it, the Epsilon artifact thingamabob, Maine's brute shot, and a pistol. <laughs> what the hell? That's a random item to just have hanging around on your wall of trophies? Seriously, why do you just have a random pistol hanging around? Would you be so kind as to leave me your old pistol? And don't worry, you'll see me again. Perhaps the next time around. You got issues, Chairman. You got serious issues. You're fucked up. Can somebody please explain to me why Felix is still under employment? Like, put my neuroses of him aside for a second. This guy single-handedly ruined an operation that was years in progress. That's a really big liability to be taking. That is a huge risk to keep him around. If I was running this operation, this guy would be out on his ass by now. Or dead in a dish somewhere. Chairman is starting to strike me as kind of sort of incompetent. I'm not gonna lie. Which is disappointing because I was really looking forward to the chairman being the villain. He was always RVB's biggest underutilized asset, the one character that you always thought there was more to him than we initially perceived. But apparently what was more to them is that he's a bit of an idiot. So as an incentive to get the job done, the chairman offers them the chance to have access to the meta suit, which means he literally pried Maine's suit from his cold dead corpse at the bottom of a glacier. Now, you'd think this would be an important plot point given that it's the meta suit, but, well, <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll get to that. Anyway, so they explore the inside of the vortex of the temple. Now, Locus in the Dream World is actually one of my favorite scenes of the season. As clumsy as the dialogue is at times, Locus is long established as a product of war, and seeing your dead comrades in a scene you already lived once is about as disconcerting as it could be for a soldier. It's unsettling, this look at a Locust that isn't completely fucked in the head by years of bloodshed and death. I don't agree with the Locust redemption arc, which I'll get more into later on, but this scene I felt did a good job of capturing that PTSD moment. Carolina in the Dream World is also really good, showing how haunted she still is by the deaths of the freelancers. Also, they look really cool in the Halo 4 engine. And the real winner here is... Yeah, I, I can't even feign surprise because of course it is. I'm a construct left behind by my creators. And that is why I have named him... Santa. <laughs> sure. Okay. What, why, why not? Oh, and also Sharkface and the Counselor are having some bonding time, and by bonding I mean Sharkface is showing incredible restraint not throwing the Counselor through a plate glass window. Those super soldier freaks dropped a building on me, and then they killed my friends. They took away the only family I ever had. There is plenty of need for hostility here, Counselor. How is Sharkface the only villain with an actual justifiable motivation in this group? How did that happen? Wait, wait, didn't he just spray paint the front of the helmet? What? Where did it go? I don't... Oh, who cares? Let's get on to what we really need to talk about. So here's what I meant when I said that Chorus addresses the alien subplot, but only kind of. See, the aliens that forged Tucker's key were indeed on this planet, and as such, they devised several towers that led to their technology, like the Tower for Weaponry, the Tower for Communications, etc., etc. Which is fine, and presents them with a clear goal towards getting help, but they don't really expand upon them. Like, why interior decorating? Why procreation? Why are these buildings and not just some kind of device, or just something they could do naturally for that matter? Can't you just fucking be done with it? And how do these towers work? What, you just turn the key and you can summon a storm the likes of which can tear a continent asunder? Are there any control panels that let you pick the weather? Can you adjust settings? Bountiful Harvest, that's a good one. Solves the hunger crisis. What about non-alien weaponry? Do the aliens not have some kind of interplanetary transit system? Because the teleport cubes were human-made, right? They were on board the UNSC ship, so the aliens weren't responsible for them. And the weaponry... 
all we've really seen are these rifles, which, yeah, they're powerful and they don't leave a single trace of their target behind, but a bullet to the head from a UNSC DMR is going to kill you just as effectively as a disintegrating bolt from one of these things. I know I'm probably in the minority here when I say I've never really taken a liking to the Covenant weaponry in the Halo series. Like, I would rather dual-wield SMGs over picking up a Needler, and there is never going to be an instance where I will want a plasma rifle over an MA5. And nothing I've seen at the alien weapons shown earlier in the series, which, granted, we barely saw any of it outside of the Brute Shot and Carolina's dual rifles, convinces me that they are any better in this universe than the standard UNSC weapons. And I'll be the first to admit that I didn't play all that much of Halo 4, at least not enough to get a real opinion on the Promethean weapons, so I don't know how powerful they really are in the game universe, but these don't really seem like they're that big of an advantage over the normal bullet-firing weapons. To illustrate my point, there's a scene in the anime Black Lagoon where this neo-Nazi with a giant gold luger is trying to pass off like it's the most dangerous weapon to man and only he can use it, but Remy just shoots him with an average gun like it's no big deal, because it's not. If you can hit your target, it doesn't matter if the gun paints the walls red with blood and brain matter or Thanos is them into oblivion. A gun's a gun. The guy pulling the trigger is the only factor that matters. So the fact that the chorus soldiers have been doing so well lately, off screen, is an indicator that all the alien technology on the planet won't save them from a hail of gunfire. Unless they have Felix's shield, which I guess is a good piece of alien tech for combat, but fuck you if I have to admit anything about this fucking clot is practical. And thus we come to... The Purge. America is the greatest country in the world. No, 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 not, not that. Purge, this purge. The gifts left behind by my creators are immensely powerful, which is why my creators constructed the purge. All sentient life on Chorus would be exterminated. It basically serves the same function as the Halo rings in, well, Halo, only on a global scale instead of a galactic scale. Which means we've officially come full circle in regards to using the Halo universe for this show. In the off chance that the inhabitants of this planet are not worthy of the alien gifts, the purge gets activated and just flat out kills the entire planet. Which seems a little extreme to me. I mean, maybe it's just to, like prevent galactic warfare, but from what we've heard, Chorus is pretty out of the way from the rest of the galaxy. The idea of them mounting some kind of assault force on the rest of the galaxy is very unlikely. I guess you could say it's to keep the planet from getting completely fucked up, but why wouldn't they just like put some kind of locking mechanism in place on everything? Unless it's like the locking mechanism that the mercenaries already took care of, in which case... The aliens suck. Remember, the Halo rings were designed to wipe out humanity in order to keep the flood from spreading across the galaxy, but here it's just so that their technology doesn't get misused. Which it already has, but whatever. But going back to what I said earlier, so what? I don't see anything among this alien tech that is truly game-breaking when it comes to combat, and the towers are so vaguely defined and never mentioned again outside of this expo dump that they don't even matter. But Okay, now I'm just running around in circles. The point is, the aliens created an almighty doomsday button that if some suicidal person really wanted to, they could grab the key and kill themselves and everyone else on the planet. And they just left that lying around, just in case. Boy, it sure would be a bad thing if someone hell-bent on killing people found out about... Ah, shit. shield falls open fire just leave the freelancer alive for me you know shark face old buddy old pal there's there's really no need to kind of like leave things in suspense like this because the woman who, who went and massacred all your friends as well as the key that you'll need to actually you know activate the purge they're they're, they're both right there you, you can just you can just take care of it now and be done so um Right now, you're lacking this little thing called motivation. <laughs> Priorities are a little out of whack. It's also worth remembering that the last time he and Carolina met, she took out five of his men with a pistol and one person backing her up, whereas here she has three other people that can just as easily... Yeah, you, you see what I'm saying. This is stupid. So, I have a question. Shocking, I know, but I think it's a pretty important question. Given that Sharkface clearly heard everything that was said during the encounter with Santa, we have to assume his men heard everything too. They know that the other sword is in another temple, because Sharkface is on his way there right now, and that bit came before the conversation about the Purge, and we know he heard that bit. 
And again, if he heard it, then these four dudes right here, who are closer to the Reds and Blues than he is, also had to have heard it. So, the question I have, really, the only question that matters in this entire season is... When they hear Santa say the words... All sentient life on Chorus would be exterminated. Did... Do they not think that applies to them? Or do they just not know what the word sentient means? Or maybe they're just suicidal. After all, they do do this. Well, if I explain it, they'll hear me! No, we won't. Our hearing is terrible. Wait, you you can hear them in there? Then, then you heard them call back to headquarters to warn the others? I need you to send a squad to the mountains east of our location. So, maybe you guys would want to warn your bosses and let them know that they have competition heading to the temple? No, we won't. Our hearing is terrible. I mean, you know, maybe it would be a good idea to give them a little heads up. I mean, if you're really serious about going through with this plan? No, we won't. Our hearing is terrible. You sure? I mean, it would be no trouble. Just a, a quick radio call and then boom, you've got advantage and the sword and Bob's your uncle and down goes the planet. It's really quite easy. No, we won't. Our hearing is terrible. No? no? You sure? Well, okay. Your funeral. Literally. But even if you want to believe Sharkface and his group of mercs might just be a tad bit suicidal, that doesn't explain why Felix and Locust would be. Because nothing we've seen about them so far gives any indication that they have any desire to die for this job. In fact, their entire goal is to live to see the biggest paycheck of their careers. Now, granted, Sharkface's message was pretty brief. What if I told you I found a way to kill everyone on Chorus with the turn of a key? So maybe they just assumed from that that they could work it out, but why would they just openly trust that kind of information from a guy they literally just met? In fact, this is their first on-screen conversation. And even if they did trust him, it's Felix and Locus. These are the guys who bragged all last season about how they planned everything down to the minute detail. And nowhere in the back of Locus's mind did it occur to him to maybe think this through more before they went barreling full towards the Doomsday Cannon. And that's the main reason why this season's big event completely fails, why 13th story just completely falls on its ass. Because the entire rising action of this trilogy hinges on the idea that Felix and Locus are suddenly suicidal enough to want to die along with the rest of the planet in order to succeed. And okay, this is jumping ahead a bit, which I don't like to do when retrospecting this series, but I just know some fucker is going to point this out the comments about how they find out later that they'll be safe from the purge so long as they're inside the temple. Here's the problem with that. They don't find this out until later. After they've acquired the sword, after they've thought it over with a good night's sleep, after they've already full committed to this plan of global extermination. Meaning they legitimately could have almost died with the rest of the planet and they wouldn't have known it. What if this hadn't been the case? What if they had just gone to the purge temple activated the key, and realized, oh shit, now we're about to die, all of our efforts were completely fucking pointless. And people think this is the best season. It constantly ranks in the top five for the series. It is a season where the main plot is that everybody except for the bald British fuck loses. And worst of all, you know immediately they're not going to succeed. You know why there was tension in previous seasons? Because it was reasonable stakes. Maybe they'll beat the meta, maybe they'll get their asses kicked. Two of their guys got gunned down in a moment of complete terror. These moments are real because they're tangible. This? They're never gonna genocide an entire planet with the main cast on it because the show would be fucking over if they did. What's worse, they confirmed at RTX that year, while the season was still ongoing, that they already had their plans for season 14 lined up. So obviously they were planning to keep going. <laughs> and yeah, that's, that's 13. A bunch of people sprinting headfirst towards their own destruction. I, I could just, I could just end the video right here and be done with it. Cause, what else is there to say? This is the worst idea they could have possibly gone with, and I hate everything about it. Moving on. How did Felix and Locust get to crash site Alpha so fast? No, seriously, think about it. They were just here. Presumably, not much time has passed between Carolina's team arriving at the temple and this assault. There's a considerable distance between these two points. Did no one in Carolina's group hear warthogs drive off or airships fly by in the near vicinity? I don't know, I'm just curious. Freckles, run command, aim bot. Hey, whoa, whoa, what do you think you're doing? What? You go find your own cover, this is mine. Oh, 
okay, I understand that they have endeared years of civil war and death at each other's hands. I get that. But there are bullets flying at them from all directions, so I'd like to believe that at some point, common sense would kick in and they'd work together to not die in this canyon. I say this knowing full well that common sense has never been a factor with this series. They get out of this mess through a combination of smokescreen and a Starsky and Hutch-esque slow-mo car leap that, while not as epic as the Revelation car leap, is still cool in its own right. And at least Wash gets to pull off this great revenge shot on Locust, which is one of the cooler moments of the season. Nice to see that fucker taken down a peg or two. Between the two of us, I'm the soldier, and you're just a killer. I need a vehicle. Ooh, he's gonna chase after Locust and have some kind of... Ooh, he's gonna chase after Wash and they're gonna have, like, one-on-one -on -one revenge fight. And this time they got the entire army of Chorus surrounding them. Locust is fucked. Meanwhile, Carolina's group has reached the mountains when... It's Sharkface! Why does he know his name? Seriously, why the fuck does he know his name? Guy doesn't even have a fucking shark on his face like he did before. Why does he know his name? I underestimated you. We get that a lot. Really? <laughs> really? The woman who smashed you in the face with a fucking gravity hammer, dropped a building on your body, and then proceeded to massacre your entire company, and you underestimated her? Dude, you should have walked into that clearing with like 300 dudes and a few air-to-ground hornet airships and just bombed the holy shit out of her position and after it was done, walk up to her corpse and put two in her fucking head. The woman is a killing machine. How do you even begin to underestimate her? Carolina takes after him on her own, which is predictable, and we get our first major fight scene for this season. So now is a good time for me to get this out of the way. Is the fight choreography better this season than in 12? Yes, actually. The hand-to-hand -hand combat between Sharkface and Carolina has better dynamic to it and feels a lot more energetic than the battles of Season 12. Is it better than the Monty era? Well, that more depends on who you are, I guess. If you're like me and you liked the fast pace and musical synchronization of people beating the ever-loving stuffing out of each other, then you're probably going to be as disappointed as you were last season. If, however, you prefer a more realistic fight that even gets tactical in a few places, then you will be pleasantly satisfied with the fights this season. Presumably. I don't know. I'm not you. I have questions about Sharkface's wrist flamethrowers, and if you're surprised by this, just remember that I'm the guy who has complained for multiple videos about the validity of armor lock. How do they activate? Is there a trigger mechanism on the glove? Like all we saw was them pulled out but no trigger pulled. Do they work on telepathy? How does he not singe his knuckles using them? And how do they have enough napalm or whatever kind of flammable liquid to propel himself down like a rocket or float down from above with? Oh, don't look at me like that. I have the exact same kind of questions about Deadshot's wrist machine guns. I have no fucking idea how those things work. Delta, prioritize the- Delta? It's too much! What do we do? I don't know. So, this was kind of hinted at during Season 12, and I remember at the time I attributed it to maybe the other personalities were starting to take over, like Omega or Sigma were starting to take over, you know, Epsilon's uh, personality. Because AI degradation hasn't really been a thing in the Red vs. Blue series. I know it's a big thing in Halo, especially in the later games, but not so much in this series. But, like, the idea that these this last remaining remnant of... Project Freelancer is now on its way out. It's like it's like one final goodbye to the organization that has been playing this series for the entire last decade. Um, and, uh, of course, it means we're probably going to have to say goodbye to Church again, because that hasn't gotten old yet. Now, Sharkface could just go down there and make sure she's dead, but that would just be too easy. Meanwhile, with the other group in the cave... Oh, thank God! Ah! And Doc's back! And nobody remembers he's missing, which is consistent with the previous two seasons. But yeah, bit of a low blow. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> you incompetent fools! You will all taste oblivion! Oh no. Let me guess, the only reason they had Doc go missing was just so they could find some convoluted excuse to bring O'Malley back into the store. Oh god. Oh god. Really? That was the whole reason you had Doc go missing? All that mystery, all that wonder, just to bring back a character that hasn't had any presence in the show since season fucking five? Are you shitting me? 
No, but seriously, O'Malley doesn't actually do anything or affect anything in any way. He's just there. It's just for nostalgia. That's all he's here for. Yeah, but sometimes he gets really Ow. weird and calls himself Ow. O'Malley. Ow. Wait, 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 what? Yeah, it's like an inside joke. Uh, no. That's not the history. Like, at all. Caboose, you of all people know this. You had the exact same thing happen to you. You can't even blame his terrible memory because no matter what has happened, Caboose has always remembered Omega taking over his mind. No matter what part of the series we are in, that is one of the few things he has never forgotten. And like, even if you want to blame Caboose's shitty memory, why are none of the others correcting it? Like, okay, I get it. Doc has always been one of those characters that kind of comes and goes whenever the story needs him, but that's no reason to rewrite his history like that, when there's been a decade of material that completely contradicts one single sentence. <sighs> well, at least fucking Doyle grabs the key, and then loses it because he's a chicken shit. Now, this bugs the shit out of me, because, okay, he throws it straight up in the air, right? If he had thrown it outwards and then ducked for cover, Felix never would have grabbed it, and the chorus armies would have bought themselves some more time. Instead, he throws it up, which gives Felix just enough time to die for it, grab it, and now truly paint him as the darker half of Tucker, a rivalry they're still trying to push for even though they barely earned that at all this season outside of two moments. Oh look, Felix is doing more evil monologuing. Should I just open my veins now? Does anyone have a rusty knife I can borrow? Wait, 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 what? That ending from before left us to believe he was going after Wash, but in actuality he was not doing that at all. Which makes this scene and the delivery of this line entirely pointless. <sighs> and yeah, that's that's the first half of the season right there. By now I'm sure you all have a pretty good idea of why I hate this season so much and why I think it deserves to die in a fire. I mean, I just spent however many minutes just completely tearing apart the main storyline for this, this season and completely ripping apart the entire basis for which this chorus trilogy revolves around, pretty much. <sighs> but you wanna know what the worst part is? This isn't even the worst offense. No. No, there's something coming up that's far, far more unforgivable. But I need to take a break now. Cause I can't do any more right now. So tune in for part two, where the real horror begins. Oh, God damn it. When did we agree that I was the one to build this thing? I did most of the work putting the plans together to make the stupid thing. How about someone help me assemble it? That's the least I asked for. Hey, watch where you're-